Welcome back to the Pro Series Podcast. This is episode 148, and today's guest is John Alwinson. He is a sales expert and a author of the book, Relentless Sales. We talk all about his book and sales. So if you are in the sales industry, this is an awesome episode for you. He talks about his years of experience in sales, his tips, his tricks, um, and some of the mishaps that he sees in the sales world. Um, but it's an awesome episode. But before we get into this episode, please like, subscribe, and review the Pro Series podcast on wherever you listen to podcasts. And now I hope you enjoy episode 148 with John Alwinson. John, thank you so much for hopping on the Pro Series podcast. Can't wait to talk to you about sales, your book, and kind of how you got started in the industry. I'm so excited to talk to you. Yeah, Eric, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited as well. Yeah, when James sent over your uh, bio and your your book and everything, I, I got so excited because we we talk about professionalism and entrepreneurship on here, and a lot of these companies that are or listeners listening to this podcast are selling a product or selling some type of service. And being a salesperson, I think everybody thinks they could do it, but it's not always meant for everybody, and they don't always get trained the right way. So, I mean, I can't wait to hear your insight on that and talk about your book later on in the podcast. But I want to start off on how you got started and like how that entrepreneurial bug kind of bit you in. Like, when did that happen? Yeah. So it's funny. I grew up with an older brother. So two years older and from 10, 11, 12, we were mowing lawns, pressure washing, knocking on doors. Um, we, we didn't grow up poor, but we definitely weren't rich. And so we kind of had to earn it if we wanted, you know, a new basketball or a new fishing rod or whatever we were going for. And so uh, we were hustling from an early age. And so um, sales, and I didn't really know it was sales at that time. It was just entrepreneurs just finding ways to make money uh, was yeah. something that we always did. Yeah. It was like born with it. It's just kind of natural. Totally. So when you went into um, through high school and then going into college, what did you want to go for? Or did you go to college? I did. So I, gra okay. I graduated from the University of Florida. So I was kind okay. of, uh, I was during those Tim Tebow years, which was quite fun. And um, little did I know what we were getting into during that era. And it was fun. Basketball and football were, uh, were the big, big winners oh, yeah. during that, that time. So um, good time to be there. It was awesome. It was awesome. But to, to answer your question, uh, I didn't, honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I just could mm. never figure it out. My parents were like, what are we going to do with Johnny? Like we, they never <laughs> knew, they didn't know what to do with me. They knew probably business. And that was the goal, get a mm. business degree and we'll figure it out. And um, little did they know. And little did I know that sales was, was kind of my thing. Oh, geez. So it's funny because most of these um, people that I have them on, on this podcast, guest wise, they're, you know, they know what they want to do their whole entire life. They go to school, they get into the corporate world or whatever they're doing, and then they, they're going into their second or third career, and that's like their passion career. What Did you ever have that um, situation? No, I, honestly, no. I don't know if your audience can, can relate to this or not, but my whole life, I mean, I knew probably something in business, but I had no clarity on where exactly or what exactly I was going to do. And so um, it, it kind of came after the entrepreneurial experience that I had, like right mm -hmm. at, right in college and after college. And, um, it kind of clicked at that point, but I think that's more common than people realize. I think not necessarily knowing what you want to do is more common than, than the former. Oh yeah. And I think a lot of people go to school and realize that they're so confused and they're like, this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Why did I go to school for this? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a tough thing to go to school at 18 years old and have to figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. That's like impossible. It's a lot of pressure too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know many people that actually do a hundred percent what they went to school for, unless you're a doctor or something you'd invest a lot of time into in school. Right. No yes. doubt. So what was your first business out of school? So we, um, during, during that era, during college era, we started an idea of generating and creating, um, casual footwear. So sandals. And I grew up in Orlando, grew up in mm. central Florida, sandals, boat shoes, camp mocks. And so we kind of had a unique flair on, on casual footwear. And so we had like a partnership with Mossy Oak and Realtree Outdoors. Uh -huh. And so we kind of had a outdoorsy flair to a casual look. And, um, and so we created that raised capital in my senior year of college, we were, we were creating a, 
a little bit of a movement, a little bit of a um, brand. And we, we launched um, a couple years after college. We were building it after college. And I just, uh, so we ran that for about five and a half, six years. And um, as you can imagine, two young guys, we made every mistake in the book from overlapping job responsibilities to, you know, just not fully understanding what we were doing in, in, in sales and, and really in creating a business. And so I have all kinds of war stories to tell you, but we, um, we, we learned a lot of the, 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 st- we learned a lot of the lessons the hard way mm-hmm. and that really formed who I am today. And it, and I made a commitment after that entrepreneur venture that I was going to learn and master kind of the, the game of sales. And so for the last 15 years, that's what I've been doing. Well, if you went back so many years or you wanted to start that business today, what would you have changed? Like what's one of the main things? Man, what I would have done is I would have stayed 100% in my lane for sales. Um, I would have mm. been a lot less fearful in calling that in buyer. Um, we were, I, I should have worked with, you know, the Bass Pros buyers closer, you know, um, their Gander Mountain, all these different uh, organizations at that point, Academy Sports and Outdoors. I would have, honestly, what I would have done is I would have bought a van uh, that had some kind of shower component to it. And I would have driven around the whole country and just sold and just stayed in my lane. Yeah. Was it, so that was like your expertise and your brother's was, what was his expertise in the business? Yeah. So he was CEO, he was visionary, he was uh, investor relations. And so he was kind of the mastermind of putting it all together. And I was coming in as co-founder sales, um, you know, we, we overlapped a lot and we overlapped mm-hmm. too much. I should have been, but I was so green out of college. I had yeah. no experience. I didn't, I didn't really know how to sell. And so, um, there were a lot of things that we, we learned, but he was more CEO ops and I was more sales. Gotcha. I feel like that happens a lot though. When you're starting a business with a friend or a family member and you are kind of trying to take everything on at once and like you're, you want to be in touching at everything every single part of the business. And it's probably hard to give that up to someone else. Um, Even though you're, you know, you're equals in the business, but it's just probably hard to give that up. It is, you know, you waste half a day looking at a website when really I shouldn't be caring about what our website looks like. I should just been like a pit bull and bulldog and just, you know, focused on my lane. And, you know, I can't tell you how many hours I wasted doing things I should have been doing. Yeah. So when it came to that day, when you, you called it quits, you kind of closed the doors. Yeah. What, what was that like for you? Is it, was that mentally probably very hard because you know, you spent five or six years doing this business that you put your, you sweat and, um, oh. and you just couldn't get it to where you want it to be, or you kind of just had to quit it. What was that like for you? Yeah. And so I think it's, it, there's a kind of a series of events and I talk about in the book a little bit in the intro of the book where we were sitting in Panera every Monday morning, we had our board meeting in Panera bread, okay. and, uh, you know, and so we, um, we, we, it was kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. I mean, we had, we, we were manufacturing in, in China. And so we were, we had big shipments of shoes coming in and, you know, certain lots would be, one third destroyed or one third, you know, and just working in, in, you know, in a global environment, we made, we had all kinds of headwinds from manufacturing issues to, you know, employees that we had on our team, et cetera. Like we just had so many problems. And so I think it was accumulation of different things to the point where at that six year mark, we kind of looked at each other and we're like, do we keep moving forward or we call it quits? And I think we both knew um, it was time with this venture to, to close shop. It was tough. It was really yeah. tough. Well, I don't mean to rewind a little bit, but when you started this and you had this vision for it, how did you find a manufacturer to work with? Yeah. Like, where do you even start? You know, it's funny. We actually, um, we had some uh, friendships with different executives that were on like the Bass Pro team. So we had, we had a oh, couple okay. of names of, of folks and then um, it wasn't even through that. It was actually through a, a sales rep that we found um, the connection to a footwear manufacturer. We reached out to that footwear manufacturer and they passed their, their people along to us that they used over in East Asia. Wow. Yeah, I was always so, interested on how you actually mass produce a product like that. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, those 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 countries are, you know, they want to work with you, but there's all kinds of headaches that come up during I the bet. process. I bet. So when you went away from this business and you got into sales, 
Um, and then you got into this book. Were you always wanting to write a book? Was that something you always wanted to do? No, I mean, you know, for the last four or five years, every morning I'd wake up and I was just kind of, it was more therapeutic to kind of write my leadership philosophy out. And so, um, so really in sales philosophy, because I ultimately I was writing it for myself. And so hmm. for four years, I just kind of wrote, you know, certain chapters on confidence on, um, you know, my sales process, like what is my sales process? And I've been a people leader for the last seven years for a big medical device organization. And, um, I'm teaching them constantly. So for me, it's kind of like me sharpening my sword and like, how, how can I replicate success across the board? And so accumulation of years went by and I showed a friend what I was working on. He goes, dude, you need to tell yourself you're writing a book. And he's like, John, just get over it. You're writing a book. And so he was the one that kind of pushed me over to get it out there to the world. That's, that's kind of strange that you kind of like subconsciously didn't know you were writing a book, but you you were, you were in the early stages and it was kind of meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think 2021, after I kind of was pushed you know, 2021, I think it was, um, you know, then, then I made that commitment, you know, but yeah. up until then I knew I needed more time to bake. I knew I needed a little more experience and I was just kind of just writing my thoughts. And, and honestly, it's a good lesson. You know, if, if your mind's bogged down or you're emotionally like distraught right now with what's going on with work, I mean, people recommend journaling for a reason. Like it does help kind of flesh out some of your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So who's your key listener or reader for this book? Yeah. So I, I talk about skills, the mental toughness and faith that I think is needed to be good in sales. And so um, for anybody newer in, in your career, if you're, I mean, if you, your audience, I know is a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners. I mean, if, if sales sometimes is uncomfortable or if you have a newer person on your team, I put my playbook out there for new people from organization to um, having the mental toughness to succeed. And I also talk about my faith in it as well, that I think that's the third pillar. Um, that's not right for everybody. Not everybody kind of has a faith element to it, but um, that's what's unique about my book is I give the skills, mentality, and faith. And so anybody who that would um, that would be appealing to is, is really my audience. Okay. So what is the most common trait or uh situation where you find someone in sales that they're lacking and that's probably what their roadblock is hmm. there there are a lot of things um i think you know i really in chapter six in my book i really outline what a really successful sales process looks like i think this newer generation of of sales people i think they lack form and so like if you're mm. a football player and you have throwing form or you're a basketball player and and let's say your elbow is out or a different position every time you're shooting a basketball you're going to be inconsistent in your sales results and so i'm kind of a nerd when it comes to sales process from pre-call planning to building rapport to finding pain throughout that process and then closing and following up mm -hmm. i think people should have um, really good form when it comes to sales without being robotic, without being um, weird in the sales process, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's something that I really, and the big thing that I would focus on is pre-call planning. I think most people don't spend enough time thinking through what that sales process is going to look like or approaching the customer. They don't take time to research the website. They don't take uh -huh. time to research people on social media and they jump into these sales situations and they're not ready or they're not as prepared as they should. Yeah. yeah that's a, that's a good point. I, I see that a lot, even in my industry, I, I said on the, off the call, I'm an interior designer and I work in the construction -ish industry and there's everybody posts everything on social media nowadays. You could see right. who they buy um, who they use for your projects. Like, you know, if they're using your competitors or maybe issues that they have, because they'll post if they have an issue or if they, whatever goes wrong or what goes right. So, you know, some of those questions that you could always already have written down and ready for when you get in there into that meeting and actually talk to them. Right. No doubt. It's so true. Everything is just out there right now on, on the web and um, everything's very transparent. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to another book, is it, is that in your, is that going to happen now? Yeah. I mean, I think at this point, I, I think the management leadership is really the lane I'm shifting into as well. I mean, the okay. sales book is awesome and I, I'm, you know, I want to get that word out there to, to the world, but I think leadership management are kind of those next two things. And then also engagement, keeping your employees engaged, um, 
are, are things that are of, of interest to me. Okay. Oh, and that's an interesting thing. Cause I've talked to a lot of small business owners and they, they struggle to keep employees and yeah. keeping them interested in the company or um, looking elsewhere. What, what advice do you have for those type of people that are, struggle with that? Keep the employees kind of interested in the company. Yeah. I think, I think it's so important to bring people into a vision that's bigger than themselves. And it's funny. Um, you know, my, my little kids are, their school, their private school is talking about fundraising for a new capital campaign. And the, the headmaster of the school is not like a sales guy, but his passion and his vision and like pulling us in, like we, people are getting ready to pull out their credit cards right there on the spot and checkbooks and write, write a check. And so I think if you're a business owner and you have some young talent, create a vision for where, where those people can fall into. And, and they may not be near that point now, but help create a small development plan and then engage them throughout each year on their progress and give them books to read and help them find different mentors and show them what, Hey, if you work your tail off with me for the next three to five years, here's what I could move you into. Maybe mm -hmm. it's co-manager, maybe it's this and develop new titles for people and give them responsibility and then also empower them. I think empowering your, give them responsibility to run a meeting. You know, maybe, mm. maybe you're too, you're holding on to things with, with white knuckles and you need to kind of let them run. I mean, that's talk about the confidence you can pour into someone else. If you're oh, like, yeah. Hey, run this meeting with this, with this vendor of ours. I mean, you can empower your people more than you realize. I think it's just getting creative and doing it. Yeah. And I think the follow through too, because I feel like so many companies do the development plan and yeah. they're all for it, full force until it's like written. And then after that, there's nothing, there's no follow through with it. And that's, that's so when awesome. the employees, like the, the whole employee's view on the company kind of goes down. Right. Right. And, and you know, one of the things I do is I have great talent on my team and I've been able to keep people longer than other managers. And the reason I do is I'll even schedule calls with certain leaders on my team and I'll call it leadership development call where I'm like, Hey, look, these are the things I've learned over the course of the year. And I see leadership in you. And I just want to talk about these different topics and, and, pour into them a little bit because what you're going to get is you're going to get that commitment in return. Yeah. From a sales, someone outside the sales, you know, I think a lot of people think a salesperson's like, they always think of the used cars dealer type of situation where they're trying to like trick you into buying something. Yeah. And that's a completely different side of sales. I'm not saying that's a wrong thing. Um, sometimes it's good for some certain products, um, but for someone who is stepping into sales, maybe they're leaving a corporate world and they, they think sales is just a better situation, better financial decision for them. What advice do you have for them? Maybe they're, they're already like in their thirties or forties and they're just finishing or they're halfway through their career and they just want to, you know, get back into sales or get into sales finally and succeed right away. Cause you know, they have a family, they have bills to pay. Right. That's the thing. When you get into sales, there is, we all have a number that we carry. And I think mm -hmm. don't sacrifice the short term for long term success. And so, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I talk about in the book and others is kind of pulling back the conversation. There's so many salespeople get in there and they want to just share everything they know and they want to talk, talk, talk. Um, what I recommend doing is when you get in those meetings, like thank them for their time. Thank them, say, hey, I have some really cool stuff prepared that I want to share with you. But before I talk about me or our company, which they don't care about, by the way, um, you know, I'd love to know what's important to you. And I'd love to know um, what's on your hot plate right now, organization wise. And so they might tell you that, you know, the sky's falling down and things are burning up. And, and so anything you tell that person after that point will just fall on deaf ears because of pain or, or, or things going on in the world. And maybe you say, well, I, you know, it sounds like now's not the best time, but can I follow up with you? Cause I would love to share X, Y, and Z with you. And so I would really make it about your customers. Don't sacrifice, don't overpressure them too early because no one likes to be sold to. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes people do like to buy, but no one likes to be sold to. And mm -hmm. so if you put them first, if you let them know you came prepared for the meeting to share some exciting things with them, but you want to ask them what's important to them first and dig and, and play in that zone for a few minutes, what you'll build is trust. 
and then they're more likely to listen to you and your your offering if that makes sense oh yeah i think it's just showing compassion you're showing that you actually care that they're a human being you're not just seeing them as a sales dollar or your your monthly quota you're seeing that you actually care about who they are because there's so many i always i'm always going to bring it back to the home renovation you bring someone in to look at your water heater or whatever they're just kind of you know if they're actually asking you questions on how you use your house, how you function, how many people are in your house, how much, how much, how many showers you take and stuff, instead of right. just trying to sell you the top of the line thing, it shows that they're truly caring about the functionality of this. And they're not just selling you on what they could get the biggest commission on. hundred percent, hundred percent. And um, I was talking to a guy who, who sells uh, equipment and he was telling me that he'll tell him like, look, I recommend this one. Quite honestly, for me, I, I make the least amount on this option, it, but I think it's the best. And here's why. And um, but but giving people like a good, better, best option, people want options. They mm -hmm. don't want too many. But if you make it simple and give them a good, better, best, I mean, that's the way to do it. I think let them decide. You don't you don't need to unless there's only one product that you have. And that's that can be tough. Yeah. And then it's someone that's maybe younger or maybe older that wants to get into sales. There's so many sales trainings out there. Is there any sales trainings that you suggest anybody to look into or get to um, learn more about? Yeah. I mean, obviously there's, there's so many people depends on what industry you are. I mean, I love anything Mike Weinberg does. He's a big, he actually wrote on the back of my book, kind of the spotlight quote, but um, okay. he wrote a book called new sales simplified. I think that's another great option for people. Um, so I love Mike stuff. I follow um, and I'm friends with a guy named Larry Levine selling from the heart. So those are two guys that are close friends and people I recommend. Um, but, but really I think, one of the biggest fallacies is like learn the skills and there are books that outline skills. Like I, you know, learn the skills, but then like believe in yourself and go so many people like second guess and like, well, I need training to do this. It's like, no, you don't like you need some basics. And then what you need to do is go ask your customer what's important to them, mm -hmm. show empathy and, and, and take massive action. And I think there's so many people who think they need all the lights to turn green before they leave their driveway that they're, that they're just, they, they, and cause sales for most people is a scary thing mm. and, um, or a thing they're like, man, I just don't want to do it. Yeah. And yeah. And confidence is a huge part of sales. That's it. If you're not you confident, you're not set, getting a sale. hundred percent. The good news is you don't need to be the smartest person in the world. Like I'll raise my hand. Like I'm, I'm never going to be the smartest guy in the room, but you know, if you have, if you have the passion, if you have the drive, you can, you can really write your story when it comes to sales. So that's, that's really what I want to get out there. And I talk about it in relentless. Like I talk about the mental toughness you need. A lot of times it's just fighting that mental game where you feel inadequate or you don't want to do it. And that's 90% of sales. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Well, so. thank you so much for hopping on the podcast. I want to finish on where people could buy your book. Um, yeah. the name of your book and then where people could follow you. Cool. No, I appreciate it, Eric. And, you know, I have a bunch of free resources on my website. It's just my name, John Alwinson.com. So, you know, tons of free resources on, on the website, feel free to download those and would love to connect with you and your audience via social. And so, um, so you guys can connect with me on social media, just John J O N Alwinson and then, uh, Amazon have the book on there as well. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for hopping on the Pro Series podcast. Can't wait to get this one out. Thanks. Appreciate it.